so I was in college in Portland, Oregon before this, and that I graduated in 2013. Um, and I'm from, like I was telling you earlier, New York City, um, but only lived there until I was 12. So we left at a really weird time in my life because we, we had like, the first house we lived on had 30 acres. And my mom used to, she's a big animal lover. Okay. And one of our neighbors is a horse trainer and veterinarians and he okay. had a ton of horses and he didn't have enough space for them so we <coughs> kept like 12 15 horses on our land and we took care of them but it was just like a complete 180 um but new york has always been a city that i still feel very connected to okay um and i always thought after college i would just move to new york um but then i was dating someone in college at the like the last year as a senior and he was a little older than i was and he graduated before me and ended up out here because he got a job at Northwestern, okay. um, basically as like a secretary, kind of in the art history department. That was his okay. area of interest. So I was like, you know what? We've been long distance for a while, and I was like, I want to give this a chance, and it's not a bad idea to not go straight to New York, like yeah. check out another city. You know, yeah. Portland I really liked, but I always knew I wasn't going to stay there. You're close with your, both your parents? Or? Yeah, my father yeah. passed away in 2012, oh, sorry to hear um, that. but we have always been, all of us, very close, and my mother and I are super close. So it's you, your mom, and then you said you had a brother as yeah, well? Yeah, I have a 23-year-old brother, and he lives in Flagstaff, Arizona. My father passed, like I said, in 2012, so that was the summer before my senior year. Okay. Um, and he was a cook. He was like the reason that I cook, mm. basically. Okay. Um, when we lived in Brooklyn, he had a really cool restaurant and I used to oh, eat really? in the restaurant like three nights a week. I was really chubby. I would eat like steak <laughs> and french fries and salad and like three different types of sorbet and it, he made everything. He was a, he was a really good cook. And uh, it was cool because when we lived in Brooklyn, we could like walk to the... My mom and my brother and I would walk to the restaurant for dinner gotcha. and say hi to dad and eat gotcha. dinner. Um, so cooking had always been like part of my life and gotcha. he and I, like I would always hang out with him in the kitchen and cook and I was a big baker in high school, just like making cookies and cakes and like, okay. um, I decided that I wanted to do something with food and Portland was a really cool city to go to college in for that food. So I actually heard about whole animal butchery when I was there Oh. Okay. and there was a woman, this woman Camus, who cool. had a little butchery school kind of thing, sort of like Rob's demos. Okay. But they were a little more hands-on, they were more expensive, but they were like five hours long and you took home like 40 pounds of pork. Like she split up the whole hog between 10 people wow. and you ever, everyone paid like $200 or $300 for the class, yeah. but everyone took home like Big $150 worth of gotcha. pork. You know what I mean? Gotcha. So it was really looked up like Googled whole animal butcher shops, Chicago, um, basically public and quality meats and butcher and larder were all that popped up. Okay. And then I just harassed Rob on the phone for like two months. And no I way. swear every time I called, he thought I was a different person. Like, and then he was like, yeah, come in, come in, come in. When you get to Chicago, I called him at least like five times over like a month and emails. And then when I finally showed up, I don't think he knew who I was. He was like, yeah, totally. But I like, don't think he connected who I was, you know? Um... But I just started going in every Wednesday. We used to have meet on Wednesdays. That okay. was the, the schedule. And originally, when I um, decided that I was going to go down to part-time, I was kind of already thinking that I'd probably move on eventually. People have always asked me if I want to like open my own butcher shop, all of these things. And yeah. the answer has never really been yes. Like I really, really wanted to learn. And gotcha. I love doing it. Yeah. But I'm not... Um, at the end of the day, I don't love selling people things and like meat is a luxury and I think it's really important that good meat be available to people because yeah. as much as we maybe wish they wouldn't, people are going to eat meat no matter what, even if it's factory farmed, like you're not going to stop yeah, yeah. people eating meat. So exactly. I think that's always been Rob's thing. It's like Rob's not trying to stop anyone from eating meat, but like he recognizes the importance of providing healthy options, you know? And also I think he's super committed to supporting the farmers because farmers are a really important part of our society and yeah. they have it pretty tough. So if true. we can, and it also just like small farms have it the hardest, they don't get government subsidies. It's like, they're just out there on their own. Um, and I really respect that about like the reason I think that butchery is so important to him. But I started getting interested in part when I bought the house 
in issues like a little closer to the city, like less about the farm. Um, and still interested in meat and like providing necessary things to people that need them. But I just started getting really interested in like architecture and real estate and like why Chicago is laid out the way it is. Gotcha. Like why is the South Side have so many empty lots? And like why does why do white people never go there? And like what's over there? And like what's happening on the west side? Yeah. And like I had gotten to know a fair amount of the city from like moving around, but hadn't really been to the far south side or the far west side and like looking for houses I just started like going on Zillow looking at different zip codes. Oh. I read an article by Tanahasi Coates who's like writes for the Atlantic, he's really amazing, um, that was about um, reparations, okay. sort of the, the very very lasting repercussions of slavery in this country and basically calling for like some kind of restitution to black America, whether it literally be like paying them to say like, we never paid you for that work that you guys yeah. did for 300, 200 years. Yeah. Like, okay. um, that's like a, that's the basic premise of the article, but he gets into a lot of things about Intense. systemic racism and institutional, uh, inequality and stuff like that. But he uses Lawndale as like an example of, um, residential segregation and housing inequality. And the fact that like, the American dream of buying your own house and having your family in the suburbs was just only really available to like white people gotcha. and how that's actually affected, you know, people's wealth, you know, like a house can help you build wealth, like yeah. investing in a neighborhood that's healthy can help you build wealth. A lot of black people did buy homes, but they bought homes in neighborhoods that eventually, uh, the value of that real estate depreciated in part because of racist, feelings where people didn't want to live where black people live. So even if you had a beautiful house in a black neighborhood, no one gotcha. was gonna buy it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And for a while black people couldn't even get mortgages. Um, so I just started reading like crazy and um, got a little obsessed. And yeah. then uh, have just been, now that I'm completely unemployed, uh, have been thinking about... It's not a bad thing. No, it's okay. I can do, I can hang for a minute. It's cool. Um, and I have, it's the cool thing about it is like suddenly I'm having all these ideas about like, what could I do? Committed to Butcher and Larder in yeah. like such an intense way. And I love that job and I yeah. like have so much love for those people, but it was exhausting. And like, I just wasn't thinking about anything else. I wasn't even thinking about new food to make. I was just like, must do these things, you know? Gotcha. I mean, like, like a schedule, this has to be done yeah. at this time. and. And you know how it is, like it's always been tight. We're always a little understaffed. Yeah. We're always yeah. like a little. These are the reasons why that, um, I don't know, the energy that the energy that you have and like the knowledge that you're speaking right now. I mean, I think those are the things that we need to start talking about. And um, this is like one of the reasons why I want to interview you, for example, or women is that. Yeah, it was, so I was a French major. So okay. I actually, uh, I didn't write the thesis in French, but I okay. ha it had to be on French literature. So I wrote on this kind of obscure, in America, he's obscure, he's pretty well known in France, but his name is Francis Ponge and he was a poet. Okay. But he wrote uh, poems in prose. So they were like usually about a page long, like a paragraph long. Okay. He had longer ones, but um, they were just like, <laughs> little descriptions. It wasn't like rhyming or in mm, meter or okay. anything like that. It didn't look like poetry, but he called himself a poet. Gotcha. And he was really cool. He was part of the resistance to the Nazis in World War II, like the underground resistance in France. And okay. he wrote um, really interesting little, these little poems about objects. So he would describe like soap or like a snail or like mm, interesting. a box okay. or a tree or a pebble. Um, and they're, but they were so much more than that. Yeah. But that one about a glass and water, and it's all about form and content and power and power dynamic. It's like just a glass of water, you know? Gotcha. So I wrote on him, and then I wrote on an Irishman, okay. Samuel Beckett, who's really famous for the play Waiting for Godot. It's like, uh, I think it came out in the 60s. Okay. Um, they both wrote in like the 50s, 60s, mostly. Um, and he's like the most bleak, stern Irishman. It's all just like, and then there was nothing. 
Like, it's just like, <laughs> but he, he moved to France okay. in the thirties or forties, forties, and was also part of the resistance and like obsessively wrote in French and translated his works back and forth between English okay. and French. So he was a really interesting author because he's Irish culture has like a really deep literary history, like poets and novelists and like Gaelic language. Yeah. So like language in Ireland is very important. And then the French also have like an intense relationship to their language and he gotcha. just did really interesting work between the two languages. So I wrote about those two, very but I literally, but I, I do firmly believe in climate change. I just have no idea how fast things will happen. I love Mexico and I think yeah. it's really great that it's relatively easy to get to and there's also just like such a diverse country geographically and there's so many different like indigenous cultures and food cultures mm -hmm. and like I've been to Mexico City but oh you have yeah very cool I had friends in middle school that were Mexican and they lived in Mexico City and I visited them twice but I think I was like 15 and 16 mm -hmm. so it's been a long time gotcha and then I went to Baja last year, which was really cool, with my brother. Very cool. Uh, I actually contacted Jimmy and Michelle to see if I can come teach classes. Oh, nice. Because Rob, so many people had so many questions. Like, yeah. the biggest thing about being a butcher isn't learning how to cut. It's, like, learning how to cook and, like, yeah. be able to talk to people about yeah. that. Like, buying meat is expensive and it's stressful because it goes bad easily. Oh, and you don't want to mess ruin it, up, it. Yeah. It's exactly. done. Like, exactly. if you overcook it or... Rob and I are like classic cutting jam is the Smashing Pumpkins. We'll just, he was a big Smashing so they're from Chicago. Yeah, yeah. And he grew, he was like a teen when they were hitting their uh, peak. Like even okay. before they were national, he would go to their shows. So oh, he's sure. like a true fan. Gotcha. So we listened to Siamese Dream, which is like their second album. Podcast every day. Um, I like top 40, like bad rap too, like Fetty Wap. Like, I don't know. I've listened to like, I love Rihanna. I think she's a really important woman yeah. and really cool. And I wouldn't, I think equality is really important in terms of like an institutional sense, like no one should be getting paid less. There's still a pay grade difference for men and women, like on average um, in this country. And like, I think that's a problem. I think there's a lot of like systematic inequality. I would say personally, I'm very lucky because I have a, like my mom is super strong and like, definitely was in charge like good cop bad cop she was a bad cop like <laughs> definitely the enforcer nice. and she and I have a lot in common and like I feel and also like my whole mom's side of the family like the Kelly women they're all just like <laughs> tiny like my mom's the tallest one and okay. she's like five six and okay. everyone else is like me and my aunts are all like five one and a half gotcha but everyone's just like bulldogs um I definitely think that um, the expectations of women and men are very different okay. and then also like it's a like your gender does become a lens through which people read the things that you say and you do so I definitely like um, have experienced and recognized the prevalence of like the bossy female prototype you know and gotcha, I wouldn't gotcha. say that's like I wouldn't categorize that as inequality but I would say it's like a weird expectation or like different perception yeah. that people put on you that gotcha. isn't it's kind of inescapable like it's hard to be like no I'm not being bossy I'm a boss like it's because gotcha. that's a hard one to turn around you know yeah. um, and then also like the reverse where it's like people expect less of me and then are like surprised when I perform certain things um, whether it's like physically because I'm small and a woman or in other ways, you know, and I do, I would say that I think maybe because of my age and my gender, I sometimes feel like I haven't been taken as seriously or like I've been a little bit passed over okay. the way that people have expectations mm -hmm. of women and perceptions of women that are for them. Like you've yeah. already made this, you've already, you already had some preconceived idea of like what I'm capable of or who I am. Um, so yeah, as more than systemic inequality because I've been very lucky, I would say I feel more affected by like those perceptions and and, I, and that's like the things that I want to like break, you know, like those. Yeah, those are think, the hardest ones to break. Exactly. Yeah. And, oh, man. Um, I guess I right now I've been thinking a lot about sort of what you're talking about with the status quo and preconceived notions, mm -hmm. and it's really tough. 
in light of like the political climate right now. But I think something that's powerful to me is that change is possible and I know that it's possible. And um, it's so easy to feel like the situation that we're born into or the situation that's handed to us or the situation at large politically mm -hmm. is like beyond our control. But everything that we do every day has like an impact. Like everything you do every day, you could do a little bit differently and like that could impact something, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And a lot of change happens so slowly, like so imperceptibly. And a lot of it is like inertia. It's like everyone's just doing this this one way and eventually 20 years later, it's like it's actually had a huge impact, yeah. you know what I mean? And yeah. most of the time it's negative. Because people aren't paying attention and there's just like habits yeah. that we form as a society that bring us to places that we didn't really want to go. But like there's so many small little changes that you can make if you're a little more conscious about it and like choose and, to and enact the those. Hard, every, the it's the hardest part. part. The I mean, if you can just like changing your diet or changing yeah. like something in your day. Is, you, and it's like sometimes I'm like, I can't do, I can't go to yoga every day. And then I'm like, you do like you sit on Instagram for an hour every day, so what do, you, what do you mean you can't go to yoga? If we stop thinking about, I mean, I think revolution and radicalism is important as well, but like, Great. it's very important to, especially in the face of things that are really bad and when you're feeling super overwhelmed, to just remember that like, change can be small and incremental, but it requires like, dedication, but it's possible to do a lot, I think. That's powerful. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah. That was fun. That was awesome. Thank you very much.